<laughs> Let's get this party started, shall we? Uh, the Lord be with you. Also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, who has created us in thine own image, grant us, uh, grant us grace fearlessly to contend against evil and to make no peace with oppression and that we may reverently use our freedom, help us to employ it in the maintenance of justice in our communities and among the nations to the glory of thy holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Happy Martin Luther King Jr. weekend and day tomorrow. We, um, for those who were at church at 9:10, you um, already heard Michaela in her cantering, and those going to 1115, you're in for a treat. So we're looking at a book by somebody called Rowan Williams. Ever heard of him? Ever heard me mention his name? <laughs> Rowan Williams was the Archbishop of Canterbury for 10 or so years. Uh, the predecessor, or rather, yeah, he preceded Justin Welby, who is our current Archbishop of Canterbury. And Archbishops of Canterbury go back to what year? Do a little quiz. 1100, you gotta go back further, friends. 1066, you gotta go back further. I have good news. Gotta go back further. Not quite first century, but I like how you're working there. 497, 597, 597 is when Pope Gregory the Great, the Bishop of Rome, sent over. Uh, who did he send over? Augustine, Augustine, not of Hippo. That was a different St. Augustine, but another Augustine of Canterbury. Uh, so in the year 597, an Archbishop of Canterbury started the work of uh, bearing witness to the gospel, to the resurrection. And since 597, we've had an Archbishop of Canterbury. And in fact, uh, when Justin Welby was made Archbishop and everyone since, they've sat in the same seat that goes back to maybe the sixth century. Uh, that could be a misquoted, but it's over a thousand years old. Um, so that's there in Canterbury Cathedral, which is remarkable. And some of those archbishops of Canterbury have been uh, remarkable theologians. So most notable is Anselm. You ever heard of Saint Anselm? Well, he was Anselm of Canterbury. He was Archbishop of Canterbury. Um, and then, you know, many theologians would agree, in, in all seriousness, uh, that Rowan Williams is, you know, up there with Anselm, one of the greatest uh, theologians. So in his book, when he was, rather, when he was archbishop, he gave lectures at St. Paul's or some such place and talked about, in Lent appropriately, the essentials of the Christian faith. And then what happens when he gives a talk um, is they turn it into a book <laughs> because it's really good. So this is where the book comes out of, is his time as archbishop talking to the people of God in the cathedral during Lent about the essentials, or as I like to call them, the fundamentals. At Bible study on Wednesday, I said, um, when I teach my children any number of things, but not least sports, Baseball, we're doing some basketball these days. We did golf last summer. Uh, we've done pickleball and a little tennis. It's all about the fundamentals. Because what kids love to do is like throw some crazy shot up, you know, and be goofy because they don't really know how to play the sport yet. So they, you know, just try to do like a highlight reel. And I'm always like, cut that out. There's no need for that. Fundamentals. Because if you get the footwork right, and you get you know, your body in the right place, and you're athletic, and you do the fundamentals, you're going to excel. And what the best athletes do is the fundamentals uh, the most effectively, and they repeat it over and over. So for us Christians, um, we're never done with the fundamentals. And that, um, the fundamentals that Williams outlines in this book is they are baptism, Bible, Eucharist, and prayer. These are the fundamentals of what it is to be a Christian. You never outgrow or sort of say like, oh, I'm done talking about baptism, I got that covered. Or Eucharist, I've read about that before, why don't we do something else? 
Uh, we always, every year, every day, can dive into those fundamentals in the same way. This is the example I like because I was a baseball player. You go to Yankee Stadium and you watch Derek Jeter, or at least I did growing up, before the game. And what did he do? He took ground balls, just routine ground balls that somebody hit with a fungo bat, and he worked on his fundamentals. And you do those really well, and you become Hall of Famer. You do the fundamentals really well in the Christian life, you become a saint, <laughs> right? You become an all-star Christian. This is the idea. This is what we all hope for, um, to be, to be uh, a saint. That is our calling, each one of us. So uh, P.D. James writes on the cover. If you don't know P.D. James, uh, she writes mystery uh, novels. I'm quite fond of them. She's a good writer. My, my introduction to P.D. James was uh, Death in Holy Orders about a murder at a seminary. And I read it while in seminary, and I was hooked. <laughs> um, but she has like 20, 20 books. But she calls this uh, text by Rowan Williams elegant and lucid, period, which I think is just the best kind of review you could have for a book on the cover, not least from P.D. James. So what we probably will do, Jay is the mastermind behind all things, but you know, during the forums, we'll be looking at um, you know, baptism, Eucharist, Bible, and prayer. I encourage you to, to purchase the book. I bought it for uh, one adult preparing for baptism about a decade ago. He read it. He was baptized. He turned up at my office with 30 copies of the book and said, just hand these out to everyone, um, which I thought was wonderful. And I kind of have. I think I have two left. So you're out of luck. You're going to have to spend $10 or whatever it is for this gym. So uh, let's, let's just sketch each a little bit now and think about baptism is that rite of initiation. That's what makes us a part of, of the body of Christ, the mystical body of Christ, which is, yes, that which we lift up at the altar. The bread is the mystical body of Christ, but it's also us. We are the mystical body of Christ in heaven and on earth, united uh, because of the grace of Jesus Christ. Baptism becomes the way that we're dropped into his life. It's what he says at the end of Matthew, go into the world and baptize um, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And with that dunking in the water, you come out of, out of those waters united to Christ forever. This, this bond, you're sealed by the Holy Spirit and marked as Christ's own forever. Williams does a beautiful move in talking about uh, baptism puts us where Jesus is, which is in two places at once, at, uh, right next to God the Father, right in God's heart, as it were. We're there. We're brought into that mystery of love, that dance of the Holy Trinity. Jesus brings us in, takes us by the hand and says, I'm going to show you a ride of a lifetime. Welcome to God's life. Share it with me. Be my friend. Be my brother and sister. And, and I will show you God's life. Um, and then it also puts us where Jesus was in his ministry, which was often in the middle of chaos, in places of darkness, um, where those, uh, who, especially with those who felt like they were pushed out from the people of God and not welcome. You found Jesus drawing the circle wider always and saying there's room at the table. So we have to be those kind of people in order to exercise our baptism faithfully. Does that make sense? So to be in two places at once, right next to God the Father, um, in the power of the Spirit, and in those places uh, that need God's healing and transfiguring love. And uh, especially you should find some of the baptized in those darkest corners of the world. And of course, in our own lives, you know, where in our community is there real need and how do we show up for that need? One very obvious example, week in, week out, Tuesday lunch program, Friday dinner program, Samaritan's Closet, showing up for the least and the last and providing food and clothing. It's a big deal. And we're there because that's where Jesus would be. So then there's the Bible. You ever heard of it? The Bible is um, a big old book, collection of books, 
and uh, written over, what, some 10,000 years, more or less. And what Williams says is that what you find the baptized doing is engaging with scripture. And he really underlines and emphasizes that scripture, when we think of it, we think of ourselves kind of sitting in a quiet room reading the Bible, because that's what we all do, right? Laugh, ha, ha, ha. Yes, we should do that sometimes. But, you know, when we think of a Bible reader, we think of one person just kind of solitarily sitting in a room reading the Bible. And that's well and good. Uh, but that is, ne- that is not how the early Christians uh, were engaging Scripture, because they didn't have pocket Bibles or, you know, uh, one on their bookshelf, because you can't carry around like 25 scrolls in your pocket, <laughs> right? These were expensive, and only the, you know, the churches with the most resources had, had Bibles, full, full Bibles. There were collections of readings, like a lectionary, for Sundays, and Christians would hear those, memorize those. A lot of the early texts have mistakes in them, different um, ways of telling or saying something, because it was coming from, you know, memory. It was an oral tradition. So the the primary way that Christians have always engaged the Bible is in community, upstairs, listening for the word, you know, listening for the word of God in in the daily prayer of the church. Make a quick plug for morning prayer and evening prayer. Uh, We do that Monday through Friday on Zoom. Uh, Consider consider joining that. Uh, You just drop in and, and see how it goes. 15, 20 minutes, a way to mark the day with scripture and the church's prayer. Um, so what, what William says is we hear it together and we're listening for, um, what God is saying to us in Christ. So the golden thread of scripture is Jesus. The reason we read the Bible is because of him. Just remember that, right? We say, who is the word of God? He is the word of God who was in the beginning. All things came into being through him. And these holy scriptures, written over thousands of years, point to him mysteriously and sometimes awkwardly, meaning, and Williams puts this uh, together for us, we read some bit of scripture and say, nope, right? God said, go in and wipe everybody out of the land and claim it as your own. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. No, (laughs) right? If the golden thread is Jesus who lays down his life nonviolently, right? And says, love your enemy. We can't go around obliterating other people, correct? Yes, that's not a big hot take. So you have to read some bits of scripture and say what God wants us to hear in this place is that some people at some points in time, the people of God felt that they were justified in wiping people out. And what God's saying to us now is wrong. That's wrong. Don't you think you can do a little better? Yes, we try and we fail. See the 20th century and 21st. But um, that that sometimes it's not just as easy as you open up the Bible and um, it's just kind of the, the direct word of the Lord for you, easy to interpret. It's so uh, multifaceted. So the way in which we read it is looking for uh, the face of Christ in scripture, listening for his voice, and then where am I in it? So where am I in it? Oh, that part where it's like violent and wanting to crush down my enemies. Where am I in that? Bad mood day, Zach, right? And then the spirit of Jesus is saying, yeah, that's not, that's not cool, man. <laughs> that's not how we're going to do this. Uh, we're going to go a different way. So we're, we're listening with our hearts to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. So you're baptized, you engage the Bible, and you gather weekly for Eucharist. And Williams' chapter on the Eucharist is, is absolutely beautiful. I especially like the last few pages um, of the chapter. He's talking about the ways in which we come to see the world um, sacramentally through our participation in the bread and wine upstairs. So as we come to this sacrament, which is God's life given to us, this greatest gift that the world has ever known, 
is given to us. Uh, we learn to see all created reality as a gift given by God. So we start to have sacramental eyes when we go out of these, uh, from this place week by week. We see the gift uh, that another human is, that an animal is, that a sunset is, that sort of making coffee in the morning is, whatever. We start to live full of that grace and gratitude and thanksgiving. And I think that's exactly right. That does not mean that we put on blinders to injustice and oppression and evil. We have to sit with all of that too. We see it with uh, greater vision and with greater compassion. Go back to the baptism chapter, you find Christians bringing that reconciling love in the midst of chaos and darkness. So it's not just, oh, everything is perfectly rosy. I'm such an optimist. Um, no, we live in hope because this is a good world made by a good and generous and awesome God out of love. And we've come to see that. And it sinks in if we practice it and we start to become more loving and compassionate and see things sacramentally. And lastly, prayer. Um, what Williams wants to underline for us is that before we bombard God with our words, um, and Episcopalians love words, thank God, we have a beautiful prayer book because we love words, and we're a wordy faith, right? Bible and preachers, and, and this is good. But before anything else, sit where, stand with Jesus in his relationship to the Father and allow that life uh, to come alive in you, the life of Christ to come alive in you and receive what God has to offer when you're in him because he's the one who prays to the Father. He is our great high priest, our intercessor. Uh, so if we just stay where he is, we allow God's love to wash over us. We allow ourselves to hear the, the challenge that Jesus might have for us in a situation. Um, and then after being flooded with that divine life, that life that Jesus shares with the Father, bring to God your petitions, your thanksgivings. Um, but, but Williams is really saying, when you start praying, be quiet. <laughs> and just let, let God's life come alive in you and then start using words. And I think there's a lot of wisdom to that. I think we all know that too. And if you try, I mean, some of you might be, you know, superheroes, but if you try later today to just sit for five minutes in silence, pay attention to the crazy dialogue going on in your head and in your heart. I guarantee you there's a lot going on as there is for every human being always, always, which should make us also very compassionate towards one another because we're carrying heavy burdens that we don't always know about. So we need to be careful and like, full of care with those whom we come into contact with as Christ would. Um, but sit with yourself in silence, pay attention to that inner dialogue and be slightly alarmed <laughs> because, because there's a whole lot going on. Um, behind the scenes, like a computer drive or something, the wheels are just spinning. So try to get in touch with, I recommend breathing in, and when you breathe out, say a mantra. You know, the classic one, Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. Jesus, I love you. Holy Spirit, come. It doesn't matter. The mantra is not the magic. Spending time with God is. Uh, but, you know, breathe in, and when you exhale, say the mantra. You can say it out loud, or you can just say it in your head. And, and let those, all the, the dialogue kind of just go off to the side. And don't beat yourself up if it doesn't work. It takes a lot of practice to get to a place where you can just rest in the presence of God. It's so important, though, because then your life can become more and more a prayer, where you're moving around in the world like Jesus did, and, you, and you're in the presence of God. And you're allowing his love to come through the situation. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't mean you're doing anything heroic. 
It just means you're allowing God's love to come through. And that's how life becomes a prayer. That's how we pray without ceasing. But if we don't pray some time in silence, it's harder to move around the world in that way. Um, so that's, that's what I know uh, as an overview of the book. Again, buy it, read it, read it slowly, reread it. I've read this book no less than, you know, 50 times, I bet. Um, and we'll go on doing it forever because it's just helpful to be reminded of what this is all about. So look forward to forums, uh, diving a little bit more deeply into each of those topics as the season unfolds. I'm gonna give you all a question to sit with. Does that sound like a deal? Whether it is or not, here it comes. <laughs> and it's a question from uh, Rowan. He has questions in the back of each, of each chapter. And we'll just do one on baptism today. Um, in what ways did Jesus immerse himself in the depths of God? How did Jesus immerse himself in God's life and humanity? In what ways did Jesus immerse himself in the depths of God and humanity? And in what ways might you follow his example? Fair? So if Jesus is immersed in God's life, and in the life of humanity, um, how, how did he do that? And how might you do the same? Enjoy. <laughs> okay, friends, um, you can keep talking for a minute. I need to head upstairs, but let me make a quick plug for the catechumenate which starts in the middle of February. That's on Thursday evenings this year. It's gonna be six weeks. Uh, we'll have food, we'll have conversation around uh, things like the essentials we've discussed today. Um, and you learn a new prayer practice each week. So consider taking that. Um, I'll teach it with Todd Stockdale, who you might know teaches theology at Seton Hall University, and Sarah Cunningham, who is a brilliant teacher. So the three of us will start that up. Consider. Signing up, six weeks, hour and a half on a Thursday, we'll feed you dinner. Uh, so here's a prayer. You've already heard it, some of you, and will again, but it's, it's the collect that our, our church has put together for Martin Luther King Jr. So I wish you every blessing today and tomorrow as we mark the holiday. Consider, as Jay said, reading one of the speeches or finding audio and listening to King uh, preach or teach or give the I Have a Dream speech. Let us pray. Almighty God, by the hand of Moses, your servant, you led your people out of slavery and made them free at last. Grant that your church, following the example of your prophet, Martin Luther King, may resist oppression in the name of your love and may strive to secure for all your children the blessed liberty of the gospel of Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And one last plug in that talking about this way of love in the name of your love, the way of love movie. Well, we've done some advertising about that advertising on E! News and in the announcements. It's a one time showing. Um, and we, you know, one generous parishioner has purchased a block of those 200 tickets uh, for us. So, you know, if you if twenty dollars is keeping you from the theater, uh, we have complimentary tickets available, just reach out to Rosa, but it would be lovely for a group of us to show up at the theater on whatever date it says in the e-news and on the announcements uh, for that movie. It's the 23rd, uh, so, and I think it's a seven o'clock showing near Times Square. So we'll, we'll get to see a, a movie put together about Bishop Curry in The Way of Love. Thank you all.